Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Time's Eye by Arthur C. Clarke and Stephen Baxter. So this is a Time Odyssey book one. I've actually previously read Arthur C. Clarke, because obviously he's one of the, like, the godfathers of science fiction, and I read Stephen Baxter's Long Earth books with Terry Pratchett, which I really enjoyed. And I saw this in a charity shop, and I thought, definitely got to pick it up. So I'm going to read the blurb. 1885, The NW Frontier. Rudyard Kipling witnesses a bizarre encounter between the British Army and a piece of impossibly advanced technology. A hovering sphere, mysteriously watchful. And then, shockingly, a helicopter from 2037 comes over the hill. Meanwhile, elsewhere, scouts from the great horde of Genghis Khan find that familiar landmarks on the great steppe have disappeared, as if they'd never been. And elsewhere again, the courtiers of Alexander the Great wait anxiously for news of the great king, who seems to have vanished. Nothing is as it was. The castaways in time must make an epic journey across a transformed world, a journey to a devastating truth. For if history is long, our future may be shorter than any of us have ever dreamed. Mankind's odyssey in time has begun. So my problem with this is that that blurb made it sound really epic, and it actually wasn't that interesting. I mean, as you can see, I've tabbed out a few things, which I'll take you through in a minute, which are worth discussion at least. But... I was expecting to kind of have my mind blown by the combination of the two authors and the blurb and it, no, not so much. So yeah, let me take you through some of the, the flags I made. All right, so we'll begin with the author's note and it goes, this book and the series which it opens neither follows nor precedes the books of the earlier Odyssey, but is at right angles to them, not a sequel or prequel, but an author quell taking similar premises in a different direction, which I thought was just pretty interesting and a word I hadn't come across before. There's a great quote from a character called uh, Abdi Qadir. He says, phones are like Catholic mothers, connoisseurs of guilt. So in this, phones have got a you know pretty advanced kind of artificial intelligence in there. But I think the quote actually holds true with today's phones as well, when they're you know pinging us with notifications. We get the grandfather paradox, the idea of, you know, what happens if someone goes back in time and then shoots their own grandfather? Would they then not be born? But then if they're not born, they wouldn't be around to kill their grandfather. And then we meet Rudyard Kipling. I thought this was interesting, and this is uh, Abdi Qadir again. He says, I don't think the British understand this at all, and maybe we understand too well. When H.G. Wells published The Time Machine in 1895, ten years ahead in this time zone, he had to spend 20 or 30 pages explaining what a time machine does, not how it works, you see, but just what it is. For us, there has been a process of acculturation. After a, tr after a century of science fiction, you and I are thoroughly accustomed to the idea of time travel and, and can immediately accept its implications, strange though the experience is to actually live through. We have a reference to pi, which as we all know is 3.14159265358979323846264338327950288841. Someone's uh, daughter likes the new synth stars who are entirely generated by computer, by machines. Uh, it says here, little girls like their idols to be safe, you see, and what's safer than a simulation? Maybe Miley Cyrus is a simulation. I thought this was quite interesting as well, one of the issues that comes with time travel, so it says... Collier's French was quite good, better than his English in fact. Like many Russian school children, he had been taught it as his second language. But Basil's version of French, dating only a few centuries after the birth of that nation itself, was difficult to grasp. It's like meeting Chaucer, Collier explained to Sable. Think how much English has changed since then. Save that Basil must have been born a century or more before Chaucer. Sable had never heard of Chaucer. So yeah, I think that's really all I have to say about this one. As I say, it was quite a dull read and I was surprised given the fact that the blurb sounded so exciting that it was so boring. Uh, I Rating time, I gave it a 3 out of 5. It was just okay. Certainly didn't make me keen to read any more books in the series. But, I mean, I've just added every Stephen Baxter book to my wish list and I, because I'm on the strength of the Long War series. So uh, I'm just going to keep reading this stuff and, and hope for the best, I guess. But yeah. So what I made of it. So there we go. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you've read it, if not, let me know if you're going to pick it up. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.